All right, in this video, we are going to talk about the parameters of a standard material. Now, as I mentioned earlier, all we're going to be using in Projects 1, most of Project 2 at least, and a lot of Project 3, is the quote-unquote standard material. So you're going to need to know the uh, attributes of it very well. Mm -hmm. Let's start off by opening up the Material Editor. And uh, the first thing you're going to see, and I can grab any of my sample slots, and currently all of these different materials are all standard materials, which you can see right here. I actually talked about that in the last video, how you can click on this button and change this to any other type of material you like. The first rollout that we have access to is the shader basic parameters rollout. This is where you can control the type of shader that you are using on a particular object. And let me kind of scoot my material editor off to the side. We'll create a nice big sphere in our scene. And let me go ahead and assign this material to the sphere like so. And let's go ahead and kind of rotate around. Kind of get the bounding box out of the way. Now, uh, the first thing we have here is the type of shader we're using. Now, what is a shader? That's a good question. A shader is going to be an algorithm that controls how light plays off of the surface. Okay. It's going to control the specular highlight or the hot spot that you get on that surface. And, you know, I mean, you don't really have to think too hard about that. Actually, people have already done thinking for you. You have people named Fong <laughs> and Blin and Oren and Nayar who've already thought of these really cool, right. wicked algorithms that mm -hmm. mathematically plot out how, ma how light will play across the surface of an object. Sure. So you might say, you know, these guys have kind of invented these shaders. That's right. Now, what we do is we just simply click on a type of, uh, of shader, and we get different aspects of our specularity. Now, you're not going to see any changes in this. In fact, if I dig through all these, you'll notice most of them look exactly like everything else, except maybe uh, well, there's one that looks a little bit different. Maybe it's metal. I don't remember, but that's okay. <laughs> if you change the specular level, though, this is where the differences between all these shaders really start to stand out. Right. Uh, we have metal, which now looks a little bit different. I think metal is the one that does look a, a little bit on the odd side. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have this really kind of interesting ring-like highlight here. If we go to anisotropic, you'll notice that our highlight has got this uh, sort of arc shape to it, as if there were tiny grooves cut all over our object. Very handy for things like brushed metal or for uh, like a compact disc. Ah, oh, very cool. Now, uh, we have, you know, I'm not really going to go over each and all the, the different shaders we have. For the most part, we'll be using Blinn which is a good all-around shader. It handles mm -hmm. specularity in a, a lot of really cool ways. So we'll just kind of leave that there and move on. Now, next to this, we have a uh, wire. If you check this, this is really cool. Look at this. We see the wire frame of our object here inside the viewport. So, oh, that's cool. Boom. If you ever need to make a, uh, a render in wireframe, it's, it. it's a single checkbox. I can just do a real quick preview render, and voila, we have wires. So very cool there. Now, I can, let me go ahead and switch that off. We have a two-sided as well. Actually, I'll switch wire back on. If we take a look at our object really closely, in fact, let me kind of help things out a little bit. I'll take my diffuse color and crank it up to an obnoxiously potent red. And uh, let's close that. Now, let me also hide my grid. Mm -hmm. Notice that we don't see the wires on the back side of the object. Right. I mean, if this were a true wire frame, it would be like a globe that was made out of wire, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you could actually see not only the wires on the front side, but you could see the wires on the back side, right. too. If we check two-sided, we'll suddenly be able to see those. Now, we don't really see them in the viewport, because the viewport uses a different uh, setting for that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, let me show you on a render. Let me switch off two-sided, do a really quick render. Notice that all you see is just the front side, almost as if this were a black sphere with wires painted on it. And if I close that and we switch on two-sided and render again, we now see the wires that show up in the background. Ah, very cool. So it's just kind of a way to uh, make sure that we are rendering the back faces of polygons, because that's the real key here. Whenever you switch on two-sided for an object, you can suddenly render both sides. In fact, as a, another quick example, not to really beat a point into the ground, let me create a plane. And we'll just drop any material you like onto it, maybe right here. And notice, currently, we don't have two-sided available. If I render from here, everything looks good. If I render from underneath, nothing. Yep. We don't see anything at all. But if I check the two-sided checkbox and render again, we suddenly start to see the plane again because we're now able to render the back face of the polygon. Very cool. So let's go ahead and switch that off. We have face map, and what this is going to do is uh, basically... 
allow us to see all of the facets of an object. Let me kill out that plane. We don't really need it anymore. I'll come back over here to this material, and let's switch off wire and two-sided. If I switch on uh, face map, actually, I'm sorry, that's not going to make it all faceted. That's what faceted is for. <laughs> face map is going to take any map that we have applied to our object, mm -hmm. and it's going to apply a copy of that map to each individual face of our Geometry. Interesting. Now let me give a quick demonstration. If I go over to Diffuse, I'm going to do our little map trick that we did earlier. We click on the little button, yep. double-click bitmap, and just grab any picture out of here. I have this little mock-up of the uh, 3D Buzz web page. Now uh, take a look at our sample slot. If you look really close, in fact, let me go ahead and give you a quick enlarge of it. We'll do magnify. Boom! <laughs> Wow. Every single individual face of our sphere has its very own copy of the image. Right, every polygon. That's right, every single polygon. And that's because we have switched on, if I jump up to my parent, face map. Mm -hmm. I switch that off, we go back to having only a single copy. How does it look as a render? I'm oh, just curious. Switch it back on. Look, going to end up looking like, a lot like that magnified image. Mm -hmm. so each polygon has its own little version of that picture on it. So uh, from there, if we switch that off, actually, that's kind of handy if you're making things like golf balls, I've found. Sure. But anyways, let's go ahead and switch that off. We can switch on faceted, and you can already see what that does right here in the viewport. That's going to basically take out all smoothing, and we can see each of the individual polygons. It also shows up at render time. You'll notice you can actually see all the little lines for each little polygon. So you have all of these checkboxes to uh, control how your material is going to show up. Again, wire if you need to see wireframe. Two-sided if you need to see both sides of a uh, particular object. Face map if you want to take one uh, like a map and place it on each individual polygon. And sure. finally, faceted to kill off your smoothing if you need to. And of course, you have the drop-down on the left, left for choosing the type of basic shader that you want. That's right, which we're going to be leaving on blend for the time being. Now, because we have this set to blend, you'll notice we have some basic parameters for blend. As a, a kind of a rapid example, if I switch to anisotropic, notice this changes to anisotropic right. basic parameters. Mm -hmm. These are the parameters that pertain to the shader you have selected. So for now, I'm going to leave this on blend as mm -hmm. kind of our standard shader. And let me grab a fresh uh, material slot, something that we haven't edited or played with too much, and I'll go ahead and we'll assign this to our given object over here just as we mess around. So the first thing we have access to is ambient and diffuse. Now, this is an area where I've seen students get a little bit confused. We're going to start with diffuse. Mm -hmm. Think of your diffuse channel as the actual color of your object. Sure. And if you pick up a basketball and I ask you what color is it, you're typically going to say orange. No, most basketballs I've seen Usually. Are orange. Yeah, they come into all sorts of different colors. Yeah. But uh, it, the diffuse color is going to be the basic color of your object. You'll notice as I change diffuse to green, boom, we get green, blue, we get blue, and so on. Mm -hmm. Ambient color is kind of like the uh, a color that is being presented by outside light. Uh, if we take a, if I try to change the ambient color, first off, you're going to notice that changing one is actually going to change ambient and diffuse, because right next to this, these two are locked together. Right. In 90% of the cases, when you're uh, actually adjusting colors of your uh, of your material, you're going to leave these locked together. Mm -hmm. So they're locked by default. You can switch this off if you want, and you can adjust ambient separately, and it just applies sort of a basic uh, kind of ambient surrounding color to your object. Okay. So uh, in this case, we can't really see it too much because uh, our diffuse is going to pretty much take over. Now let me go ahead and just leave these locked together. Lock colors, yes, so they both become uh, uh, green again. For the most part, we're just going to be adjusting diffuse and let ambient come along for the ride. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, underneath this, we have the ability to control our specular color, which right now won't do anything unless I step down one and boost our specular level. Let me do that, and I'll come back down and talk about specular level uh, a little bit more in depth in a few moments. So we have our specular color. This is the hot spot that appears on our object, which you can see here. Mm -hmm. I can change the color of that hot spot by choosing any color of the rainbow, and you'll notice now it's, it's green, but of course we're kind of laying green over pink, so we get this kind of really funky color you see here. Interesting. I can make it blue. I typically, uh, I won't change this very often. It's kind of nice if you're making a metallic-like surface. Like if you have, uh, say let's, maybe you're doing a paint job for a car, and the car is, you know, red and it's really, really metallic, you might add just a little bit of red to your specular color to make it look like the light being reflected back is picking up some of that color. Sure. Kind of a, a nice effect, but for the most part, we're going to be leaving this uh, pretty close to white, so we'll go ahead and leave it there. Now, uh, next to this, we have self-illumination. This is whether or not this object will appear to be emitting light. For now, let me switch off the specular level as we adjust this, 
And as I take self-illumination and start to crank it up, you'll notice the entire object gets brighter, including the shaded areas. Mm -hmm. Now, don't let this confuse you. This object is not emitting light. Right. At least not with Max's default renderer anyway. All this is doing is making it appear as if it might be uh, emitting light, as if it were illuminated from within, or, or maybe like it itself is actually creating a light source. Sure. Now, this is not something that, uh, again, you're ever going to crank up too high unless you really want to give the illusion that an object is producing light. However, I have uh, found like if you're creating organic surfaces, things like plants and whatnot, adding just a little bit of self-illumination can make something look uh, a little, I guess, alive, a little more vibrant. So it's just uh, something to kind keep in mind. A little more organic, maybe. That's true. You can uh, check the color swatch, and you can actually provide a given color for this. So you can make, you know, kind of control the color of the light that your object would be emitting. Just keep in mind, it's only an effect. This object is not really emitting light into your scene. You cannot use this object as a light to illuminate things, uh, again, using Max's default render. Let's go ahead and switch that off, and we'll pull down self-illumination. Next, we have opacity. How opaque is your object? Currently, it's set to 100, so we see our object completely. As I start to bring this down, our object starts to fade away. It becomes more transparent. That's right. As we get down to zero, we can't see it anymore at all. Now, there is still a faint representation here inside our viewport, mm -hmm. and that's just to keep us from completely losing the object. If we were to render right now, we wouldn't see anything. So there's opacity. Down underneath this, we have specular level, which I actually demonstrated a second ago. Now, notice as I adjust the spinner for specular level, we have this little bubble graph here that kind of domes up into the air. What you're seeing here is a graphical representation of the hot spot on your object, mm -hmm. of your specular highlight. As I push this up, you'll notice my specular highlight gets brighter. As I pull it back down, it gets a little bit dimmer. We can control glossiness. Notice how that tightens up the graph. It's also tightening up your specular highlight. The more glossy an object is, mm -hmm. the more plasticky, I guess you could say, it's going to appear, as if it were really shiny plastic, where if you bring, uh, let the glossiness stay very low, you have more of a metallic look, where your specular highlight is spread out over a broader surface. Sure. So you can adjust that from there. So from here, we have a, a slight soften ability, where if your specular highlight, you, know, you have the size and shape that you want, but it still looks a little bit too harsh. You can add a little bit of softening to it, just kind of you know, make it look a little uh, softer, I guess is really the only word I can come up with. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to mention this before I go too much further. You'll notice next to a lot of these parameters is a little tiny blank gray button that if you mouse over it to try to get a tooltip, it just says none. Mm -hmm. So evidently, the, you know, how many, what kind of functions does this button have? No, no, that's not true. <laughs> this is a map button. Right. This is where you can take maps, and we talked about maps. Mm -hmm. They can be created by you in another application, mm -hmm. such as Photoshop. They can be downloaded off the Internet in the form of bitmaps, JPEGs, uh, Targas, TIFFs, all sorts of things. Yeah, an image is like a two, or a map is a 2D image that you can use to control one of your parameters. That's right. They can also be procedural, created by 3ds Max itself using a mathematic algorithm. Mm -hmm. And you can apply them to your object using these buttons. So diffuse, remember diffuse? It's just the color of our object. Right. I can click on the map button next to that, and here's a list of all the maps I can create. Sure. Now, I'm not going to go over each and every single one of these maps. We have bitmaps for anything that we have either created or maybe downloaded. Mm -hmm. So, Like you saw earlier, I brought in a picture of the 3D Buzz web page using that. Uh, we have checkers. Of course, yep. you know, if it's 3D animation, it's got to have a checker sure. somewhere. I was actually going to point that one out. Do a checker. So we can double-click checker, and now mm -hmm. we've applied a checker to our object, but we don't see it. Why? Quick review. We didn't do show map and viewport. That's right. Time. We have that little button for show map and viewport. We click that, and now mm -hmm. all of a sudden we can see the map right there. So you can see the checker has been applied. Mm -hmm. But notice this. Our window inside the... Uh, the material editor down here, our parameters have now changed. Right. Now, instead of seeing the parameters for our material, mm -hmm. we now see the parameters for the checker. We have its uh, coordinates across the surface. We can offset it if we want to. You'll notice as I adjust that, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, the material, the map, kind mm -hmm. of marches around the surface. Excuse me. I can control the tiling. How many uh, copies do we see across the surface? Yeah. I can mirror it. I have all sorts of different things I can adjust in here. Mm -hmm. I can apply a noise to it if I want to so that uh, the whole thing kind of looks a little bit wavy. If I switch that on, then it starts to, to kind of be active. Mm -hmm. And you can see it kind of waving up here. You don't really see this here inside the viewport by default, but that's okay for now. So, uh, again, the point is that now that we've applied a checker, we have the checker's, uh, I'm sorry, the checker's parameters available to us. Right. We've actually gone one level down in our materials hierarchy. That's right. And if I bring up our material map navigator, you can see 
Here's our standard uh, material we were playing with a second ago. And then if I click down on the checker, we've stepped down inside. Now we can adjust its parameters. And just a real quick thing to drive a point home, take a look at this. Here are the two colors of our checker. We have black and white, but we can make yep. these any colors we like. Like here's red and white, and we can make these maybe red and blue if we want to. But notice next to these, we also have a map button. Right. So we can go even further. We could take uh, the red checkers, click map. I could double-click bitmap and bring in that 3D Buzz web page that we had earlier. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, if, one if level I down again. click show map in viewport again mm -hmm. now, so it's kind of covering the whole thing. It's uh, something that's probably only going to show up at render time, which is okay. Yeah. But I've, I've gone down a, an, another level. Let me jump up another level like so. Mm-hmm. And if we uh, click Show Map and Viewport, you'll see, again, all we see right now is, uh, is our red, but that's okay. Let me go ahead and just click Render real quick, right. and you can see it here inside the render. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, let me open up my Map Navigator. We now have a hierarchy starting to occur. We have our material, we have a map, and we have a map that has been assigned to a map. Yep. So we're trying to really kind of you know, mix things up a little bit, but the whole idea here is that these parameters are going to change based on whatever it is you're focusing on right, right. now. So if you're down inside, you can, of course, use your material map navigator, which I use a lot to jump between levels. Mm -hmm. Or, of course, you have your uh, go-to-parent to jump up and jump up, and now we're at the highest level, the material itself. Sure. So uh, that's a quick thing over the map area. Let me jump down to some of these other rollouts that we have access to. We have extended parameters. Uh, these are things that cover things like advanced transparency, which we're not really going to be jumping on right now. We can control index of refraction here, which if you've never heard about uh, index of refraction, this is a numeric value that controls how much an object is going to bend light as light passes through it. Sure. I think uh, like air is like 1, and uh, water is like 1.33. Mm -hmm. Diamond, I think, is like almost 2. I can't remember all of them. But you can actually look up uh, numerical values on the internet, mm -hmm. the mighty internet, and these are real world values. These are not something that are uh, just local to 3ds Max. Uh, actual physicists use index of refraction the same way that we would use them in Max. Yeah. So you can look up the real index of refraction for any object. Like uh, I even saw one site that you had the uh, index of refraction of various cocktails. <laughs> like if you have like a, like a little bit of rum and water, mm -hmm. then it'll give you the index of refraction for that. So you can actually make it all match up as it does in the real world. You have controls over your wire. Remember earlier on I showed you how you can, you can uh, switch on the wiring ability. We can uh, adjust the size of our wires. So you'll notice I made my wires really fat. We can make them kind of thin, which uh, this will be a little more apparent at render time. If I push these up to four and hit render, we have these nice, big, thick, fat wires. If I set them down to maybe 0.5, which is really kind of thin, we have these really tiny, thin wires like so. Underneath this, we have reflection dimming, which is not something I really want to get into right now. It's suffice to say that if you're uh, ray tracing and you have a reflection like a mirror, you can kind of dim down the reflection. Like if you ever have a character sitting on like a dull surface, you can kind of make the reflection uh, that is underneath him kind of fade away a little mm -hmm. bit. So uh, that's extended parameters. Down underneath this, we have super sampling. The only description I'm going to give for this right now so that we don't get things too confused is this is a way to keep your, uh, your textures in your scene, your maps, from looking too jagged. Mm -hmm. Like if you had a, a brick wall uh, of material applied to an object, and in your scene when you rendered, the, uh, the grouting on the brick wall looked kind of jagged. You could use super sampling to kind of blend that out, in a, in a way anti-alias it, but I don't really want to get into anti-aliasing sure, yeah. either. It's a whole separate topic. So uh, let me go ahead and close down super sampling. Down from here we have maps. Now, all of those maps that we were applying to diffuse color, we can apply maps to specular color. We mm -hmm. have access to them here. And this is super, super handy. Uh, notice I have my slider bar over here, just like what we have over inside the command panel. Yep. I can drag that up to the top. Let me switch off wire. And uh, we have this uh, map to checker currently applied to our object. I can pull down the amount, this little tiny spinner right next to this, and notice we start to kind of, if we look up here inside of our... Uh, our material slot, we start to see more of that original diffuse color. So it's a way that you can control the final opacity of every single map you apply. Yeah. Very, very handy. And the maps rollout is basically a list of all the different maps that you can use to control different parameters of your material. That's right. You can use this in a lot of ways, too. These buttons allow you to click on a certain area. Like if I want to add a map to, I don't know, maybe opacity. Mm -hmm. I can click on this, and I get a list of all the maps I can create. Of course, right. I can go to a custom, something I've made in another application, mm -hmm. such as a bitmap. I could grab um, maybe a cellular, which you know kind of has this weird noisy type of effect. Mm -hmm. Instead, though, I want to show you another uh, way you can use this window, and I use this a lot. 
you can also drag these buttons around. So let's say I've got this uh, checker applied, and I want to apply this also to, I don't know. Maybe? Well, we won't use bump right away. Let's just go with opacity for now. Okay. I can drag this down to opacity. When I let go of the mouse, we have a, a little window that pops up asking, do you want to instance this? Do you want to copy it? Or do you want to swap it? Now, instance is going to behave just like an instance over inside the viewport, where if we adjust the attributes of one, if like, uh, it'll automatically adjust the other. So right. let me just start with that. We'll click OK. Sure. Notice we have Map to Checker in both slots. If I click on either one of these, we jump down into the parameters, mm -hmm. and adjusting it on one side will adjust it on the other. Right. Basically, uh, adjusting it here will adjust it there as sure. well. Now, I can also, this is, a really, this is a really cool trick, I use this a lot. If you need to clear out a map slot, mm -hmm. if any of your slots still say uh, none, you can just drag that on top, boom. Right. It's a way to clear it out There's real fast. There's actually another way you can do that, too. There is. A, let me go ahead and undo that real quick, or maybe it won't let me. <laughs> I don't think I'm... <laughs> but yeah, if you click on the map uh, up there... That's right. Actually, let me just uh, do it here. We'll click sure, OK, sure. and we can go, come back down here and select this guy. Now, yep. notice this button, which earlier we were using to control the material type we're using, mm -hmm. now allows us to change our map type. Right. I can click here, and we have none at the very top. So right. double-click that, and there we go. So, uh, let's see. Uh, down from here, we have bump map. I'm not going to be getting into the nuances of bump maps just yet. In mm -hmm. essence, this allows you to... Create the illusion of a tactile surface. Yeah. You know, like alligator skin with right. circuit boards. Like bumpiness. That's right. Bumpiness. Does the thing look like it's bumpy? Uh, you can control reflection, refraction, displacement. You can map all of these things. And any maps that you create on a material will be visible in here for your editing pleasure. Now, let me go ahead and minimize this rollout. We'll move down from here. We have dynamics properties. Now, we're not talking about dynamics, but uh, suffice to say, if you have an object in your scene that, uh, let's say it's made of rubber, and you're setting up a dynamic simulation, and you need this object to behave like rubber, mm -hmm. you could actually assign some dynamic values to a material, so that any time you apply that rubber material to an object, it'll behave like rubber as well. Very cool. And that's not something I really want to dive into right now, but you have kind of a general idea of what this rollout's going to be used for. And down from here, we have the direct X manager, which is uh, if we want to see any of these materials uh, using strictly DirectX. We're not even really going to delve into that right now. Sure. So with that, we have dove through all of the parameters of a basic standard material, mm -hmm. and this is what we're going to be using a lot. So make sure that you do kind of play with these, make adjustments to them, uh, really get used to adjusting your diffuse, adding some maps, add maps on top of maps. It can mm -hmm. be a lot of fun. Uh, learn how to navigate through your maps using the uh, material map navigator sure. and also using the go to parent button. Mm -hmm. Remember things like uh, showing maps in viewports, very, very important. Yeah. And uh, that, I believe, is going to wrap things up for this video. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.